boxing, how do you really make someone into a star? Looking through some recent big names, there are a few trends that really stand out. The ability to make even the dullest of interviews entertaining, an exciting highlight reel and the ability to run verbal rings around opponents in the build-up. If I'm honest, maybe a little bit of each. Americans especially seem to like the approach of, fuck the haters, I am the special one and no one else can compare. I mean, saying I'm a solid 7 out of 10 isn't exactly going to get you retweeted these days. And now we are seeing a more and more self-centered approach to selling yourself, not just in sports, but in media generally, and sometimes not even in media. And in a lot of ways, there is nothing wrong with that. Personally, it can make for some TV gold, especially when you have someone who comes out and says they are completely different from the rest, and then actually goes out and proves it. The stories of McGregor, Adesanya, Tyson and Mayweather could almost be there just alongside Cinderella in the fairy tale department. Well, maybe not right alongside. But even after saying all that, this is why when I was looking into Canelo for this actual video, I was just struck by just how different he is from the typical superstar personality that we see these days. If you watch any Canelo interview, even now, he seems almost kind of shy behind the camera. And it's weird for me to say, a 23 year old speaking about a 30 year old megastar to say, but you can almost see the shy kid in him. Of course, a degree of that is that English isn't his first language, but just have a look at his body language here. No sé, me... Quizás a lo mejor también el, 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 el peso me ayuda mucho. I'm no expert, but it looks genuinely uncomfortable to me, twitching and nervously smiling, but in a way that almost makes him endearing. It was almost like he just hadn't signed the biggest contract in sports. This almost puppy dog exterior isn't the only way he stands out from the normal megastar. You hear the guy talk over and over about one thing, and that's legacy. But not where legacy basically means just making your money and heading out the exit door like Mayweather or McGregor. Legacy to Canelo actually means making your mark next to all those other great fighters and being remembered for more than just boxing. No, no, y que nuestra palabra vale muchísimo. Yeah, he said to represent his legacy. He wants to be to represent the Latino community as much as possible. He doesn't feel like they're respected as much as they should be, whether it's in business or just in life or just here in the U.S. for that matter. A cynical person like myself even would say that it's easy to say that you don't care much about money straight after you've signed the biggest contract in sports, but, well... I actually don't have much of an argument against that, but if you do look at Canelo's resume, it is the best in boxing, bar none. You could maybe argue Pacquiao based on an entire career, but if you look at in the past five years, it's just no contest. I'd also argue that what sets Canelo interviews apart is just how softly spoken and philosophical he sometimes is. Maybe it's something that comes a little bit with age, and maybe it's something that comes from where money isn't as much of an issue as it is with other fighters. But when Canelo does talk, he's often looking at the bigger picture in life. Very rarely do you get a sense that this guy is really insecure with anything deep down, and his philosophy of learning from your mistakes is something that everyone can relate to, including myself. The thing is, the way the Floyd fight ended, Canelo didn't really have much of a choice other than really taking the fight on the chin and saying the better man won. But the difference here between Canelo and someone like Zab Judah is that his career didn't really go downhill following that loss. He didn't let that loss define him. So when he says something like this, I actually believe him. I, I agree with that. I don't, I don't take that fight like I lose. <laughs> I take that fight like I am learned from that fight. And again, you can see that slightly more wise old outlook in just a beautiful display of manhood. To give everyone a little bit of backstory, during Canelo's camp for Shane Mosley all the way back in 2012, Canelo needed a place to stay when he was out in Big Bear. So he and his camp went around and scouted out a few places on the market. And then completely unprovoked, you hear the neighbor doing this. I'm not impressed that Canelo didn't beat the absolute shite out of this guy because you'd have to be an absolute moron to be doing that. But it's more just a lack of posturing, the lack of bravado, and how comfortable he seems to be in his own skin. It's just refreshing somehow.
To switch up completely for a sec, with me being the small part of the boxing community that I am here on YouTube, I often find myself looking at boxing breakdown type videos and a lot of the time I find myself conflicted. On the one hand, I love how creators with the same passion as me look at specific techniques at specific points in fights and describe how they kind of worked in the moment. But on the other hand, I'm sometimes thinking, well, you've showed how this one technique works in this one instance, and now you're trying to tell me that this is some sort of golden rule and it'll work in every scenario? Nah, that unfortunately is just not how fighting works. Different techniques work at different times for different fighters. To use a bit of an egg-based analogy, sometimes you have the tools in the kitchen to make scrambled eggs work, sometimes fried, sometimes poached. It really just depends on what the situation is like at that present moment, as well as what tools you actually have at your disposal. This is basically the same as teaching fighters what guard to use. Sometimes a high guard works, sometimes a cross-arm defense, and sometimes a shoulder roll. It really just depends on the situation and what skills your fighter actually has. So it's pointless to say that because X technique works in Y situation for Z fighter, you should always be using it. But anyway, in response to those sorts of vids which do have a place here on YouTube, I much prefer to take a bit more of an open view, to look at a fighter as a whole and to go through his or her whole career and only from that do you really find their distinct techniques, their improvements and their style. And that is what made Canelo so attractive to me for this video, because you really don't need to go too far back to see the improvements that Canelo has made in his career. I'm going to start with the Lara fight for two reasons. A, this was the last fight that I thought Canelo looked truly limited as a fighter, and B, I really liked this fight. It's not an absolute barnstorm or anything, but it's just a great clash of styles and boxing philosophies. Plus, the build-up was pretty tasty for two guys who normally do their talking in the ring. <laughs> Laura, for anyone who is completely unaware, is the epitome of the Cuban style. Slick, southpaw, and uses a hell of a lot of footwork. And in the early rounds, it was a little bit like watching a rhino try to get to grips with a swarm of wasps. Canelo was just not used to having to track down an opponent whose movement was bordering on excessive, albeit effective. Canelo just wasn't really cutting off the ring either, looking more like a dog following its owner. And on the odd occasions when he did have Lara back to the ropes, he didn't really use too much of a jab to set up the big shot. Canelo was just looping him into the head, which would allow Lara to either slip out to Canelo's right or roll under the left hook out to Canelo's left. You can sometimes see the actual frustration getting to Canelo as he looks to plant his feet for a big right hand, only to have the Cuban slide out of range and force Canelo to reset. Despite Canelo being Mexican and having fast hands, he was never an out-and-out -out pressure fighter like Gennady Golovkin. When you look at Canelo when he's this green, you can see how uncomfortable he is trying to track down a fighter like Lara. In fairness, like 99% of fighters would be. I mean, Jarrett Hurd only did it via the boxing equivalent of opening a window by headbutting the glass. And look here, Canelo throws a jab and Lara slips outside. Canelo then backs up straight with his hand outstretched. And from this position, Lara's backhand is perfectly in line with Canelo's head, and he should have been caught. And I'm just showing you this because, yes, Canelo had successes, which I'll go over in a little bit, but this is not the Canelo that is able to create dead space in the pocket and make fighters pay like he does now. From very early on, Lara had great success moving to Canelo's left. What he'd do is wait for the jab to come in and sometimes throw the left straight away as a counter. And then he'd always finish with the right hand jab to maintain the distance. Essentially, a reverse one two off a slip. And Lara so often leaving the center line to Canelo's weaker side gave Canelo fits. And it was only in the second half of the fight that Canelo and maybe even his corner began giving him some tools to actually deal with the Cuban. What he did is begin to time Lara exiting with the left hook to the body. But even here, when he did start to land a few of those in the second half of the fight, I never really got a sense that Canelo was having the fight he wanted. It was more that he just found a decent answer to the terrible style matchup he was in against. 
In a few points in the fight, you can even see what both guys want to do, with Lara moving out to his right and Canelo trying to catch him with a single left hook. Canelo even tries to hold Lara in place just to stop that really annoying movement going on. And it's also definitely worth saying that there was very little of that trademark head movement from Canelo in this fight. This was very much a hands up, walk Lara down kind of fight. And I'm not saying I was expecting to see Canelo track him down like Mike Tyson, but if you watch these clips, or actually if you just watch the whole fight, there isn't much active hand movement with the defense, and there's not much rolling when a shot lands, just to take a little bit of the edge off. Yes, Canelo had successes to the body at points in the fight, but there wasn't much of what I tend to call intelligent combinations, where one or a few punches opens up the opponent in order to land. He was just kind of rattling him off. Look here at how just a simple jab can back Lara to the ropes where Canelo can actually get his work off. And in this clip here, an almost non-committal left hook forces Lara to cover up into a defensive shell, still leaving Canelo in a good position to finish the combination. A lot of these techniques are pretty subtle, but I think that is what Canelo was actually lacking in this fight. Just a little bit of subtlety and a bit of nuance that comes with experience. And you can't say Canelo didn't take that kind of feedback on board, because despite who you ever think actually won the fight, this was the last time that you can ever say Canelo looks so one-dimensional. To change this up a little bit, I'll personally say that I'm not much of a boxing historian. I'm not the one who's going to be poring over fight films of Salvador Sanchez, Julio Cesar Chavez and Felix Trinidad, even though I probably should. I put more times into the modern day because those tend to be the fights that I cover and talk about with friends. But saying that, even I know the significance of Mexico v Puerto Rico in the boxing world. And that rivalry really was at the center of the buildup between Canelo and Cotto. In hindsight, I'm almost surprised that the fight actually happened, given the amount of ducking and diving there was at middle when Golovkin was at his peak. Who he knocked out recently, and you look just as good knocking the same fighter out. Do you have interest in that fight? Uh, uh, why, why not? You know, but... Uh... This fight is a bit of an odd one to me because despite being such a huge fight, I wouldn't say there's much of a long lasting discussion about it. Maybe it's because Cotto was at the tail end of his career or maybe it's because Canelo looks about two weight classes bigger in there, but people almost tend to brush it off and kind of say, well, it was a passing of the torch fight and you know, a good big man tends to be a great little man. And that is a shame because on a rewatch, I think this is the start of what I'll call the modern Canelo Alvarez. Prior to rewatching this fight with my analytical boxing breakdown hat on, I had the idea that Canelo landed the harder shots while Cotto landed the more but weaker point scoring shots, and that Canelo almost brute forced his way through. But on a rewatch, Canelo wasn't just out muscling Cotto, he was out boxing him. In the first 20 seconds, you can see the improvements the Mexican made by just being aware enough to dip down from a potential counter and to slip out. And on the front foot, look at the improvements in setting up the shots here versus the Lara fight. In one, it is a wild swing that the opponent saw a mile off, and in the other, a feint backs Cotto up, a half power left hook forces Cotto to cover up, while still leaving Canelo balanced, who then finishes with the right hand combination. It is just beautiful boxing, which has as much to do with balance as it has to do with raw power. Like in pretty much all his fights from now on, Canelo mixes the jab and hook from the outside to keep you guessing. He's not exactly the kind of boxer who's going to be busting you up via a stiff jab, but what he will do is use the variation from the lead hand to either back you to the ropes or to draw your guard into a particular position and then to exploit the resulting weak points. 
Manipulating the guard really became Canelo's bread and butter in this fight. It can be as simple as jabbing or fainting to the body and then throwing a right hand over the top. Or it can be as complex as fainting a jab, then fainting a right uppercut and then finishing with a jab. I've literally got 10 of these clips titled Soul Traps in my Adobe Premiere bin and I wish I could include them all because the way Canelo effortlessly floats through feints to half punch shots to full power shots is nothing short of beautiful. I'm now going to have to include this clip even if it doesn't quite work in the script because I just love it so much. First, let's watch it at full speed. Too quick to even see what's happening, right? Now, let's watch it again in slow motion. Cotto throws a jab, Canelo parries it using the rear hand and then counters using the same right hand. It's just amazing, the balance and the timing of it. As I keep on saying, these are quite subtle techniques, but to me, the beauty of Canelo is that his style is both entertaining to casuals who just want to see a guy get absolutely sparked, but it's also interesting to people like me who like to read into the techniques. That being said, the Cotto fight was the first real fight where he had such heavy use of his head movement. And while it was effective in defense, Canelo didn't really use it much in an aggressive front foot game. This is only really something he would use a little bit later in his career. But as I've said before, this is the start of what I think of as the modern rounded Canelo. And even in interviews, you can hear Canelo himself appreciating just how important this fight was for him. For you, Canelo, what was that fight that, that, uh, that made you feel th that great feeling as a warrior? When I fought with um, Miguel Coro. I was going to say that one too. Yeah. Who was a great one of the one of the one of uh, my best best fight. I I feel like I feel like uh, when I when I won that fight, I feel like oh, okay, here is my yeah. It, my my best moment is coming. As I've kind of said before this, it was a frustrating time to be a boxing fan. On the one hand, you had Canelo, whose promoter and manager seemed dead set on avoiding Golovkin, claiming that Canelo was just too small to fight at 160, which is of course ridiculous. And on the other side, you had Golovkin himself, who while he was blowing everyone away, almost seemed to be in a Terence Crawford-like position of smashing absolutely everyone but lack the big names to be remembered as much more than a KO merchant who beat B-plus level fighters. From memory, the public perception at the time was that Canelo would probably get broken down by Golovkin, especially since Canelo had a little bit of a reputation for fading in fights. This did kind of change following the Triple G Jacobs fight, where Jacobs showed that Golovkin could be outboxed from the outside for large portions of the fight. The decision going Golovkin's way was in no way a robbery, but it was a close fight that, like most decisions, tend to go to the fighter who's the bigger draw. It's a shame, and for the record, I gave it to Jacobs by a point, but unfortunately, that is boxing. But this is boxing. Obviously, he's a bigger draw than me, and they want to make that super matchup with him and Canelo, so Daniel Jacobs probably got X'd out. But anyway, following this fight where Golovkin seemed human for the first time in years, the Canelo fight did magically get made. What a coincidence, I know. And on the night of the fight, it was about as close to a 50-50 as you can get. And the general perception for the fight was that, could Canelo get Golovkin's respect or would Canelo be out mexican on the inside? The thing is, Canelo has never really been a volume puncher. He's a guy who has always fought in spurts. Destructive spurts, sure, but he's never going to be the guy who's going to overwhelm you with activity. And Golovkin, while heavy-handed, I would never really call explosive. He's more of a methodical assassin. It's kind of like the difference between Adonis Stevenson and Sergei Kovalev. One is a wrecking ball and the other a grenade. And I think that difference is mainly genetic. You're never going to make Conor McGregor a marathon runner the same way you're never going to make George Foreman a 100-meter sprinter. And as such, this leaves the age-old adage of stars make fights. And in Canelo Golovkin 1, you can say many things, but you can't say that Canelo ever looked comfortable in the role he was playing in there because, in essence, he was forced to do things that genetically doesn't really come natural to him. In short, Canelo fought on the back foot. Whether that was the game plan coming in or whether he just didn't have a choice and Golovkin forced him that way is up for debate, but I just don't think it really worked for Canelo. 
He looked like a guy who was being outworked and someone whose upper body movement was working overtime just to keep his head above water. I do tend to break down fights from very much a technical perspective, but this I think was much more of a physical problem as opposed to something like the Lara fight. When Canelo did put the punches together here, he looked class, but being forced to work constantly and having a guy who seemed to have some iron implanted in his chin just didn't equal success. I mean, have a look at Canelo here and say he doesn't look absolutely shattered. Just have a look at his legs. I'm not saying that you couldn't have actually scored the fight as a draw, and the debate definitely did rage online, but Canelo being forced to work and to use his legs for the full 12 rounds just isn't something in his wheelhouse, and when the inevitable rematch did come, something just had to change. Hindsight is a beautiful thing, and in hindsight, it's obvious that Canelo was going to have to stand his ground a little bit more in the rematch, because if you look at so many of his recent fights, that come forwards counter punching combination style is a Canelo trademark. But I do remember a good deal of Golovkin fans basically saying that using this kind of style was nigh on impossible. But in the rematch, Canelo did elect to hold his feet a little bit more and to use some upper body movements, not just to avoid the shots on the back foot, but to set up punches on the front foot. If I'm honest, there wasn't really much of a radical change in technique from the first fight. It was more of a change in the overall style he employed, and that made for a much better fight. Of course, Canelo being Canelo, there were a few subtle traps, using the parry and counter technique from the Cotto fight, and some beauty shovel hooks. I mean, is this a body shot or a head shot? And yeah, there were moments where Canelo was just outworked from the outside, but from my perspective, and I have only scored it the once when it happened, a UD for Canelo is perfectly justified. I know there is an absolute ton of controversy about both fights, and if this vid does get some traction, I might even go back and rescore both fights properly. But if anyone does care, I gave the first fight to Golovkin by four and the second to Canelo, but I can't quite remember how much. If I was going to summarize both fights in a nutshell, I'd say the first Golovkin fight showed the limitations of Canelo's physical ability, and the second fight showed the extent of Canelo's technical ability, and both fights showed Golovkin's fight IQ and mental ability. And I mean, what is Golovkin's chin made of? Two good fights for sure, and it's just a little bit of a shame that the judges' scorecards have kind of overshadowed the actual fights, and almost a rivalry in general, and I can't even really defend that. Canelo threw eye-catching shots. Canelo was the one who was pressing forward in the earlier rounds, so therefore I could see why he got the decision. How often was Golovkin on the ropes? No, he wasn't on the ropes. So if, if you back up a fighter and you can't I said get he him, was pressing. I didn't say you, he backed if, him if up. You, was, you press, uh, 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 don't, press, don't misquote me now, Mr. You, Magic if, Man. If you press a fighter, right? if you press you a fighter. You call me the Magic Man, I'm Merlin up in if, here. If you press a fighter, but you can never get his back to the ropes, is that effective aggression or is that called getting out box? But now Canelo was left a bit without a dance partner at middleweight, and so Danny Jacobs came in to fill that void. A solid fighter, sure, who arguably beat Golovkin, but a guy who lacked a little bit of a signature win. And post the two Golovkin fights, the Jacob fight didn't really generate too much hype, bar a bit of a tasty press conference, because it was another one of those good solid names that an established champ has on the resume, kind of like Joshua Parker, where you've got a guy going against the legitimate top five in the division, but it's also a fight where 80% of the people really think it's only going to go one way. And if I'm honest, that is exactly how it went. I think I see this fight now as Canelo bedding into what I call his signature style. If I was going to give it even more weight, I'd say that this fight showed the improvements that Canelo has made from all the way back to the Lara fight five or so years before. Because in Lara and Jacobs, we have two guys with respectable to good power, good speed, and who both don't really like to sit in the pocket, but can land some solid shots if they need to. There are obvious differences, of course. 
Lara is much more in that amateur Cuban style and Jacobs is much more likely to get into exchanges. But the important thing is that coming into their respective Canelo fights, the game plan for both fighters were broadly the same. Frustrate Canelo from the outside using the bigger reach and force Canelo to get sloppy coming in where he can capitalize and get out before he knows what's hit him. But in the Jacobs fight with this new revised style, Jacobs really couldn't get anything going and that is a testament to Canelo's skills on the front foot. I do think that there is a little bit of a misconception with boxing fans that in order to be the ring general, you need to be dancing around the ring like Muhammad Ali. But in boxing, it is possible to be both aggressively stalking your opponent and to be the guy with the better boxing skills. In short, the ball can be smarter than the matador and Canelo's head movement and decent hand position gave Jacobs fits. It's not like Canelo was landing 100 punches around on the guy or anything, but when there was class in there, it was only really coming from one guy. I mean, look at the speed of the catch and counter here. Or in this clip, the great use of the head movement to set up the counter punch. In the fight, Jacobs used a fair bit of head movement at the ropes himself. Canelo noticed this and began making the necessary adjustments. I'm just gonna show you a snippet of what I mean. Jacobs is backing up here and Canelo starts with a jab just in order to back Jacobs to the ropes. He then follows it with a right hand left hook combination and at this point instead of winging away to the head which a younger Canelo might have done, he finishes to the body to make sure he hits at least something. I don't want to sound like a broken record here but you can really see the improvements not only in the punches selected but in the balance, variation and intelligence of the shot selection. And to add to this, he's actually cutting off the ring now, so you have a defensively sound pressure fighter with razor quick hands and counter punching ability. I mean, how in hell do you fight this guy? Even Golovkin couldn't really get going against Jacobs, whereas against Canelo, you could see where the elite class was and it wasn't Jacobs who had it. And I'm not saying that this fight wasn't close. I think I gave it to Canelo by two or four. And also, it's really a fight that you're not going to re-watch bar being a very small YouTuber making a very niche video on Canelo's fighting style. But it is a fight that showed Canelo approaching a level that all fighters strive to get to, and that is to be truly complete. And it also got him one step further to being quite simply the best pound-for-pound -pound fighter on the planet. Canelo had now permanently made his mark at middle, and so following a highlight reel knockout at light heavy, he was now looking at the best fighters at 168. And so, despite a lot of interest from fighters like Caleb Plant and David Benavidez, it was Callum Smith who got the nod, the best fighter at super middle, and a guy who was definitely no mug. He's got good assets. He's a big guy who can punch. Uh, he's got good reach. He's six foot two, I think, uh, maybe a little more. Uh, he's got good height. 6'3". Uh, 6'3", six, three. Six, three, he's got good range. He's got a good jab. He's got a nice straight sneaky right hand. Beautiful counter left hook. Really nice counter left hook. Made me think a little bit of uh, Ryan Garcia with his great counter hook. The way I was breaking down this fight at the time kind of reminded me of how I thought about the Kovalev fight where it was basically Woods Canelo finally meet his match against a seasoned heavier opponent in a Teofimo Lopez Lomachenko kind of fight. It is worth reminding yourself at this point that Canelo is an extremely stocky guy, the kind of guy whose neck starts at the top of his head. So despite him being Canelo, he is still only a five foot eight fighter with a relatively short reach going in against guys who are over six foot and know how to use it. So taking that into account, maybe Canelo taking center ring and looking to pressure Smith wasn't too much of a surprise. And I can't really break it down more than that. He cut off the ring and he cut it off well. So the next step was to disarm the guy. Canelo typically holds a high guard, but he doesn't use it in a traditional European way. Whereas a lot of European guys and a few Americans as well, hold their hands high in a fairly passive defense, Canelo prefers to parry and slip shots that come his way, as well as take him on the gloves. It's almost the best of both worlds. There is a space in boxing for the passive type guard, maybe when you're the taller fighter in there and you can afford to use range as your primary mode of defense, 
or maybe in the first two or three rounds against a fast fighter when you're not quite in tune with their timing and speeds. But for Canelo, this hybrid style on the front foot has really paid dividends in his career. Typically, when the jab did come his way, he would simply take it on the gloves or just a small parry. And then when the bigger shots came in, he would simply pull back and let them whisk by. The beauty of this technique is that unlike a dip, where a lot of the time your feet would move back at the same time, Canelo's feet remain broadly where they are, keeping him in counter-punching range. What this means is that he's able to pressure Smith on the front foot and make a miss while remaining in range. And as a boxer, having a front foot guy calmly make you miss and making you doubt your own work is just about as scary a thought as you can have. Of course, some punches need to be thrown here at some point, so you had the usual variety of left hooks and jabs. I haven't really mentioned it much before this point, but Canelo Alvarez's jab is one of the most underrated punches in boxing. Yes, if you search Canelo highlights on YouTube, you're going to see all the flashy combinations and head movement, but Canelo's jab really does complement all his other tools well, as a good jab should. In fairness, saying all that, this is really the only fight I can remember when I've seen Canelo really sit down on his jab against a top opponent. I'm sure someone can correct me in the comments, but damn it, I've broken down six fights in one go. Just give me a break. But back to the point, it was jab on jab on jab. And what didn't help Smith was that he only had effectively one arm to defend it. If I'm honest, most of my breakdowns come from me sat there with a teapot watching a fight for 20 seconds, pausing it, making a note, rewinding 10 seconds and put that on repeat. But this bit only really came to my attention in the post fight. In MMA, a common technique is the calf kick. This basically slows an opponent's movement and just generally fucking hurts. And there isn't really a similar technique in boxing, or so I thought. It's not exactly the same, but what Canelo would do is throw a looping right over at Smith's left shoulder, and he would just do this over and over. This had three effects. It would lower the guard for the straight shots, it stopped a potential counter left hook from Smith, and it meant Smith's arm was, in his words, fucked. What can you tell us about it and how it affected you during the fight? It's, it's, it's fucked, to be honest with you. Um, and it was in, like, I said, it's a lad, it was intentional. I knew from the first round, I said to Joff, and I'm one, he's aiming for my arm, every right hook he was throwing he was going for my arm. And then I think after round four or something, I said to John, my arm's fucked. And then it kind of took away. Me catch left hook, which is my best shot, and whether that was a plan on their behalf, it worked at three. It's a bit of an odd one to look out for when you watch the fight, and I did get to the point when I was thinking, maybe I'm the one imagining this, but it is there if you look for it. There's also this beautiful moment in the 12th where they both acknowledge the damage to the arm mid-round. It could almost bring a smile to your face if you didn't know how much pain Smith was in. You can even see him taking a look at the arm here in the post-fight. Plus, I'm no doctor, but that is not a tricep. That is a bad, bad swelling. At this point, I plan to finish off the video going over Canelo's trademark combinations again. Maybe talk a bit about how it's not just a hand you need to watch out for, but there's a few incredible foot feints as well. But you know what? After 20 or so minutes, or whatever this is, I think I made my point. When I started making this video, I wanted to do something completely different to other boxing videos here on YouTube. I wanted to create a video that sought to explain how Canelo has improved as a fighter over the past five or so years. But it's only really now that looking at all my premier bins that I realized how ridiculous that task was. How can a 23 year old nobody in his bedroom reasonably break down what is possibly the most complete boxer in the sport today? And the short answer is that I can't, but I hope I've done as good of a job as I can. Voy caminando, no sé qué hacer.